computer, that's fine. Uh, uh, welcome to Wellington, Bert. Uh, it's good to have you here. Um, I know Vienna, it must be nice and cold up there right now, and it's beautifully warm down here in Wellington. So welcome, and this is One Mindful Breath. Please, um, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks much, Ramsey. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And Vienna is actually getting nicer. It's the first day of spring here, so what, what could be wrong? Um, and it, it's above freezing, so it's really good. Um, just to kind of um, introduce myself a little bit like you have thankfully all done. I've been like Derek in it for over two decades. Um, and, and I'm also struggling to um, become a beginner. Hard work. <laughs> it's really hard work indeed, yes. Um, the, the topic I had suggested to Ramsey that I cover today is about selfing. Um, or a Buddhistic concept of, of self. So for the complete newcomers uh, to Buddhism, don't be scared of. Um, or if you're not interested in this at all, uh, just meditate while I'm talking. I'm, I'm not offended at all. Um, that's, that's just fine too. So uh, the, the first question, of course, is why would anyone want to talk about self? Um, and not self. And from a Buddhistic perspective, uh, it's one of the three characteristics of existence, um, which are dukkha, often rendered as suffering in English, anicca, or impermanence, and anatta, and not self, or no self, and we come to that uh, translation. And the interesting thing is, in the Buddhist text, in the old text, this whole discussion of anatta, not self, only appears once in the anatta lakana, uh, lakana sutta. And still, at least in my Buddhist socialization, there's a lot of emphasis on this point and a lot of conversation about it. And, and one of the seminal texts from the 50s by a Buddhist monk called Valpola Rahula, in a book called What the Buddha Taught, he says, according to the teachings of the Buddha, the idea of self is an imaginary false belief which has no corresponding reality, and it produces harmful thoughts of me and mine Selfish desire, craving, attachment, hatred, ill will, conceit, pride, egoism, and other defilements, impurities, and problems. It is the source of all the troubles in the world, from personal conflict to wars between nations. In short, this calls me from the place of all the evil of the world. Well, how's that for motivation? <laughs> yes. um, but but what does it really mean? And and it, this this has been a question I've been grappling from the beginning of my practice, um, where I had quite a bit of frustration around this because the traditional response by my early teachers was, um, well, just. Good. And it it will magically become clear. And I've I've never found that response very satisfactory. And and this topic has come back uh, to me. And over the last year, I've been trying to practice around it a bit more. And I'd like to talk a little bit what I try to do there. I think another aspect why why I'd like to talk about this is that uh, the secular Buddhist um, realm that I am in is very interested in expressing some of this ancient stuff in more contemporary language. Um, and, and 
our contemporary language, of course, to a, a large degree is influenced by um, the sciences, our humanistic uh, history and, and philosophy. So I, I'd like to make the attempt um, tonight at reframing the whole discussion of self a bit more in the language of, thought, of science and particularly evolutionary psychology and see how they can help us with our practice. Okay. Um, so Rahula talks about a false view, a fundamental false view. And I think the corresponding Pali term he's using um, or he might be using is MOHA, so M-O-H-A. For the newcomers, don't worry too much about it. Um, but, but when you read texts, I think it often makes sense to uh, look behind the scenes a little bit, if you've got any interest at all. So this MOHA thing is often or usually translated to English as delusion. So we're suffering from delusions. Um, I, I think that is an okay translation, uh, but as a non-native speaker, it sounds slightly pathological to me, this term. So like if it was a mental illness. Um, and I don't quite think it is. There may be an aspect of it, but I don't think it's, it's really about a mental illness. And, and Stephen Batchelor, one of our teachers, so Ramsey and mine, and, and I'm sure some of you know Stephen as well, usually translates Moha as confusion, which again, to me, as a non native speaker, sounds a bit like um, too emotional as if there was only an emotional upheaval and if that died down we could see through everything just fine. I don't quite think that fits, fits it very well either. Uh, I think confusion would be like um, a, a sandstorm or the image of a sandstorm um, where if it died down, we still couldn't see clearly in the desert because there's still a Fata Morgana there um, or something like that. So uh, the word that I like to use here is illusion. So we see something that's not there or we don't see something that is there. Um, so from that perspective, I, I think that might be helpful looking at this from, from with, with that term in mind or that image in mind and specifically as it comes to the Buddhist teaching you, you kind of could uh, draw a nice analogy um, if you watch really closely you see how the illusionist does things and and that's kind of the image of practice that I'm currently um, pursuing so which obviously raises the question of who tricks us? Who is the illusionist? And, and again, here I think that it really helps to look at this from the point of view of uh, the theory of evolution. And, and what does evolution do? Obviously, um, there's a lot of mutations and selects um, fit, fit for survival versions of those mutations with the overall goal of preservation of um, a species and life in general. But kind of the downside of it is that it doesn't care at all about individuals other than as gene bearers. So it's not concerned about our happiness it's not concerned about uh, truth or concepts like truth, and it tricks us unscrupulously um, if it works, uh, if it works in the sense of passing on genes. And I'm kind of uh, phrasing this as if uh, evolution has a, 
a will of its own, and of course it doesn't. So I'm, I'm just using that as a shorthand for the mechanisms that work here. So um, Aaron Beck, one of the founders of cognitive behavioral uh, therapy, said about this, uh, the cost of survival of the lineage may be a lifetime of discomfort. And I think this is what the Buddha may have called dukkha, this discomfort, at least in a, in a first reading. And it, it raises the question of, well, if that is the case, how does evolution get us to play along? And it does that by giving us a good feeling for doing something it wants us to do. Um, and since it wants us to do stuff that is good for us repeatedly, let's that feeling pass. And even more, um, it lets us believe for the next time that um, when we do what it wants us to do, the feeling will have a lasting effect or at least la last longer than it actually does, which leaves us continuously unsatisfied, um, which I guess is a, another aspect of Dukkha, and from my perspective, kind of the key one. So the, the key in, in all this are really feelings, and I think there's a scientific consensus that the evolutionary purpose of feeling is to get the to do what is good for us, what is good for the survival of the genes, that is, and to keep us from doing what's bad. And that starts already in single-celled organisms. They have kind of uh, feelings that push them out of uncomfortable environments, so maybe too acidic or too warm or too cold. And if they've got any means of movement, they use that um, to move out of that environment. So it really starts at a, at a very raw sensory input level. And it's kind of a hard-coded judgment of our surroundings. Simply to speed things up um, and, and, and be more effective and more likely to survive in the environment. So which, which leads to um, a, a conclusion that, that I draw that you simply can't stop judging. And it, it sounds like most of you have never been exposed to a lot of Buddhist kind of preaching, but, but one of the things that you often come across in traditional schools is that um, kind of a, advice uh, to stop judgment. And, and suspend judgments. And, and I think on a fundamental level, that's not really possible. And I think what's really meant by suspending judgment is how we react to that. Um, but there is a, a, a pure feeling coming with every sensory input that we have, which is a judgment. And I don't think we can get rid of that. And I also don't think we can get rid of that in our thinking. So what, whatever goes on up, up there, we've, we've got some effective quality as well. And there's some nice experiments being done in, in, um, in science around this, where they do so-called priming um, exercises and experiments. So they give people one word to just read quietly and then after, after half a second or so they give them another word and ask them to read that out aloud and then measure the time between when the, the second word flashes up and, and the word actually gets pronounced. And when you prime someone, say with the word bird, they are quicker to pronounce something that is in, in the same realm like Robin, so a specific word. And interestingly, on the, the, the feeling side, um, they've done similar experiments with priming people with things like um, sunset and then following that up with different kinds of adjectives uh, like glorious 
um, and which which is kind of well primed by by thumb sex and and people can digest it much much quicker. If you um, show the word horrific after a sunset, people struggle a bit because there's a, a misalignment. So, and, and the scientists draw the conclusion out of this that with every noun that we basically think, we also think uh, uh, an adjective or a whole cloud of ad adjectives, uh, which usually gives the noun a bit of uh, an effective meaning. And in in Buddhist circles, this whole feeling thing is called Vedana, um, just for, for the newcomers. So if you come across that, Vedana is the term for feelings. But from an evolutionary perspective, they're designed in a way that they feel right. So they actively discourage an objective engagement with them. Um, that's just how I feel, and it's got to be true, right? But the question is how we are reliable our feelings at all. And we could say that, that feelings are true if they actually get us to do things that are good for the organism. But in some cases, they don't. And you could say that feelings are false, or uh, I prefer the term an illusion, if they misguide us. So here, here I come kind of closer to my um, definition of, of moha. I think it's an, an, an illusion in the sense of a feeling that is false. And, and that can be um, simply a vast exaggeration that evolution has built into us. So I think a good example for that is uh, when we are on a hike and we see a stick on, on the path, um, our mind makes us imagine it's a snake um, just, just to make sure that we actually avoid that. And, and our, the, the evolution actually uh, is, is more interested of, of taking the risk of giving us a heart attack um, 99 times out of 100 if um, at the one time when it's actually a snake, it makes us avoid uh, an, a deadly encounter, a potentially deadly encounter. <clears throat> and then there's the, um, the, the sets of feelings that probably were true in its original setting, but it haven't adapted um, to our modern day. So our genetic setup is pretty much um, 70,000 years old and life back then was quite different to today. And, and we struggle with some of uh, the things that we still have uh, from that time. Um, maybe some of us were food and particularly sweets. So uh, where we have an, an inbuilt craving for sweet stuff because it's always been a great source of energy. Um, but in also more subtle situations like um, giving talk. In, in a kind of hunter-gatherer society where your livelihood depended on, on everyone else in the village, of course your social standing was extremely important and your survival um, was dependent on that. But today, I mean, if you like what I say or like me or not, uh, doesn't have a real bearing on my survival anymore. So my being nervous in talking to you is actually not helpful at all. Doesn't serve any, any real purpose. <laughs> uh, another good example that I know very well is, is kind of road rage. Um, same thing basically, you, you encounter someone um, that you probably will never meet again in your life and you still get all fucked about um, 
you get excited or angry um, about someone else, you shout at them. Um, simply because we have that building mechanism to make sure that we are not shortchanged, so that in that hunter-gatherer society, um, someone cannot exploit us, uh, at least not more than once. So um, there's, there's a bunch of feelings that haven't really adapted well to a modern uh, kind of society. And then, of course, there's this Dukkha mechanism, if you will, that feelings over promise and, and other deliver, uh, under deliver. So I'm, I'm not saying that feelings are generally uh, false and to be um, looked at with, with, um, with doubt. Uh, certainly not. They are very valuable in, in probably most situations still, but just not all of them. And I think it's uh, upon us to make the judgment if they are helpful uh, or not. And how do we do that? In Buddhism, as, as, as always, the answer is look very closely. Look how they work, how they feel, what impulses they give you. And um, magically, that will give you some insights and, and loosen the power over you. And we'll return to the to role of feelings in the context of, of self in, in a little bit. Um, but I'd, I'd like to talk a bit more about that anatta thing. Um, so the not self. Um, and the discourse that I mentioned, the Anatta Lak uh, Lakana Sutta, is kind of a typically Buddhist story. Um, if you've ever read one of these things in the Pali Canon, uh, there's five mendicants sitting around, they hear the Buddha talk, and they're immediately convinced by what he says. Just like that, and, and not just convinced, they're even enlightened. Um, so, um, quite good. Um, fortunately, it does, unfortunately, it doesn't quite work for me uh, when I read the text. Um, but what he does is go through the so-called so five aggregates uh, that make up our experience, uh, which are form and feeling and perception and inclination and consciousness, and, and looks in each of those if he can find itself. And of course, he can't find a self. Um, and that's, that's his way of kind of defining this not self. I cannot find it here, there, nor in, in consciousness. It does not give a positive definition of what a thought might be. He, he only alludes, alludes to two aspects what a self might entail. <clears throat> One is control. And the other is persistence through time. So, so the, these are two things that I'd, I'd like to look at that, uh, uh, look at a bit more in detail. But, but having read this text, so the kind of mainstream Buddhist conclusion has been, okay, then apparently there is no self. Um, so translate anatta as no self. Uh, in brackets at all. And I think that is actually intellectually untenable, even in just Buddhist mindset. Um, who or what would be liberated then uh, by the practice if there's no thought? Or if you're inclined to believe in reincarnation, uh, what exactly is it then that gets reborn? So I'm not concerned about the latter question um, at all, but, but people have done a, uh, a lot of mental acrobatics throughout Buddhist history, I, I think, to prep, uh, grapple with this uh, problem. And I think for no good reason uh, at all, it kind of misses the point, in my opinion. Um, you, can, you can easily sidestep the problem if you don't take self as a noun, and, and turn it into a verb and, and call this thing selfing. So something that's going on rather than a thing to look at. 
And in that uh, Anatta Lakano Sutta, Buddha himself gives a bit of a hint on that because he always uses the phrasing um, in terms of a change of relationship to experience where he says, this is not me, this is not mine, um, this is not myself. And, and it kind of points to that there's something going on that is not me, not mine, not myself, and not a thing. And uh, uh, the first time in modern times that I've come across that interpretation of uh, selfing or not selfing um, was from a, a scholar called Peter Harvey, who in a book called The Selfless Mind in 19... 95 um, wrote that the not self is not so much a thing to be thought about but something to do and I think that is very much in in line with um, Stephen Batchelor's reinterpretation of a lot of the teaching in particular the four noble truths into four tasks so not statements about how the world is but um, instructions what to do with it. So how can we do that in practice? Um, so let's look at the two aspects that Buddha mentions a bit more. <clears throat> so control. Who's the boss here? Who drives the bus? And um, there's interestingly enough a bunch of experiments in, in psychology where they try to look at that aspect of control a bit more. And one interesting area of control um, experiment was with split brain patients. So for some time, I think in the 50s and 60s, uh, they tried to treat epilepsy, uh, epilepsy, if that's the right word in English, by kind of cutting uh, the the two hemispheres in the brain apart and which left um, or created a number of fascinating results. I mean, it stopped uh, seizures, but from a, a processing perspective in the brain, some, some things uh, don't work as normal anymore. So when you, for example, show people uh, a written word in their left visual field, something like nut, it's processed by the right hemisphere. But conscious language processing happens in the left hemisphere. So if you give them a command um, kind of to the left hemisphere to take an object out of the box, um, they, where there's a lot of stuff in there, out of all this stuff they pick the nuts without knowing why and do that quite reliably. Or if you give them the commands on the left side again, or left visual side, oh, um, they get up and go someplace. Um, and when they ask, so the conscious language processing side over on the left, they come up with some invented story why they go and stand up. <laughs> so um, quite, quite interesting. Uh, but it's not just for, for this special group of people, um, it's also with us um, quite regular or regular special people in things like subliminal messages um, where, you can people, uh, get, where you can get people to do something uh, by sending them uh, a message that doesn't become conscious. They did uh, experiments by giving people rewards for how um, strong they pressed someone's hand um, and they kind of primed it by showing the, the, the money amount uh, that they would get as a reward and without knowing about the motivation uh, it influenced how, how people actually behave. And there's also some, some quite famous um, experiments by Libet who showed that uh, he, they could already detect that the decision has been made um, in a brain scan 
about half a, half a second before the person got conscious of, of that decision. So there's some decision already going on without us, us being involved and us being a conscious us. <clears throat> so if, if um, there's, there's not really a boss out there who guides our behavior, and the, the current model that they uh, have in evolutionary psychology is that of uh, a modular brain. So where they assume that there's multiple uh, mechanisms in, in the brain um, that pursue evolutionary goals. So it's not like brain areas, um, like visionary or auditory or and so on and so forth, but these different areas working together to achieve a evolutionary goal. And things like self-protection, mate attraction, uh, mate retention, and so on and so, uh, so forth. And, and these sub-cells, as some call them, um, they are in, in frequent competition. And it's very often uh, just the circumstances that determine which module wins. So uh, one nice example uh, in, in an ex experiment is where they gave um, people a career questionnaire. And, and, and where, where amongst other things, they asked for the importance of uh, compensation. And um, this is rated much higher uh, by men if there are simply women present in, in the questionnaire. So that mates uh, attraction um, module kicks in and and it gets more important than say uh, fulfillment in your job or, or doing something purposeful and and uh, there's there's other experiments where they show people movies and then have them rate different marketing slogans and after seeing a horror movie like shining people are more likely uh, to like slogans like seen by one million people rather than um, stand out uh, slogans like um, this is really uh, an outstanding museum or whatever it may be, which is rated higher after, say, a romantic movie. Um, but we can't switch completely from uh, say a romantic mode to a fear mode. So this is something that's not really uh, under our control. We can obviously set um, the, the circumstances by watching particular movies and so on and so forth, or react into our experiences, but we can't really consciously change that. Um, and it's also the case that um, these modules get stronger as they get rewarded. It's kind of a reinforcement learning, like we all do as, as kids and, and, and always. Um, so the more successful a module is, um, the stronger it gets, the more likely um, it is that it will determine our behavior the next time around. So, if I have an, a problem in a hunter-gatherer society where I approach a, a woman sexually, for example, the libido module may urge me to do so, or the social status uh, module may advise against it. I may be pushed back or uh, publicly um, ridiculed or maybe by a husband be beaten over the head with a club and things like that. And, and if my approaches are successful, um, it's, it's very likely that that libido module is more active the next time around. So um, what drives these modules, however, and coming back to the feelings conversation before, um, is that feelings thing. So, when, when there's different modules in competition, what really happens uh, is that the different feelings behind them and driving them are in competition as well. And it, the, the, the strongest feeling in a sense wins. Um, and, and here there's this 
kind of crucial point from a Buddhist perspective. So if feelings influence kind of the, the acting out of a module, that is where we can do something about it. Um, where we can observe the feelings without uh, attachment, um, which prevents the modules from actually seizing control of consciousness. So, and, and by then depriving them of their reward and, and hence making the feeling as well as the module weaker the next time around. Okay, um, the other aspect that, that uh, the Buddha talked about in his talk, um, other than control, is this persistent through time uh, topic. And clearly we do have a sense of permanence, of continuity, um, of essence. Um, and, and, and maybe we even intellectually like that module model and no one really driving the bus. But we still have the feeling that something's really me. <clears throat> and a me that lives on, um, that's still the same from back when I remember when I was four, four years old or whatever. Um, and we know intellectually that's not the case. We have changed, but still there's this feeling of con continuity. And uh, the point of what is happening here, um, again from a psychology perspective, is that we permanently tell ourselves stories about us and about the world, which actually is the mechanism of re reinforcing that sense of continuity. And this storytelling is also why um, evolution um, developed a conscious self uh, through scientists. So, um, Jerome Barco, for example, who wrote The Adapted Mind, says, it is possible to argue that the primary evolutionary function of the self is to be the organ of impression management, rather than, as our folk uh, psychology would have it, the decision maker. So, so basically, uh, what our self evolved to uh, basically the about departments, uh, sending out post releases. Uh, kind of with the reasoning that it's helpful to convince other people to go along with what you, your organism wants, if we are convinced ourselves um, and, and of ourselves to be in control as well. One interesting aspect about that, it's not just about telling others and ourselves coherent stories about ourselves. We always tell flattering stories for ourselves. So, um, like driving a car, uh, there's, there's tons of studies that show that a large percentage of people think that they drive a car um, more skillfully than the average. So, like 90% think they drive above average. Or um, in team members, each team member thinks that they contribute the most. So we have a bit of an illusion of competence going on there. And if there is anything we are more impressed by than our competence, it's our moral fiber. Uh, we have an illusion of morality. We all believe that we have above average morality. And uh, when we do not act morally, it's just down to circumstance. So um, there's, there's, there's even a term that one psychology, Anthony Greenwald, termed for this uh, benefactance. So we think of our, ourselves as beneficial and effective and and uh, that is kind of the two key illusions that we think are deeply ingrained in us and and on the flip side in others we we make a what psychologists call a fundamental attribution area error so when someone else does something that is not morally correct or otherwise incompetent, 
we uh, attribute their behavior to their essence. So they are always like that. They are just stupid, dumb, or uh, a cheater, or whatever it may be. So um, that that that's that's what's going on there uh, in in terms of creating some permanent and in, embellish permanent as well. And I think that the key practice there to deal with that is to continuously ask ourselves, well, is that really true? Um, which is actually one of the things that I learned early on, or uh, one of the, well, I shouldn't say learned, but one of my teachers uh, told me early on to do. So um, to, to summarize well, what I wanted to say is um, that we suffer from an illusion of ourselves in terms of control and persistence and it, its nature. And the thing that does this selfing is our storytelling, um, and which is the, the main reason for consciousness. And, and feelings are uh, what they are. We can't really change them. What we can influence, whether we grasp on them, whether we appropriate them or let consciousness appropriate them. And if you're not appropriating feelings, that is not self or not self. -in. And we do that by recognizing, accepting, uh, embracing, investigating what's going on, through which we paradoxically create a distance uh, that then gives us a choice um, whether we want to be drawn in and we want to follow that built-in feeling uh, to an action or not. And if you're at all interested in um, this topic and want to know more, I'd really recommend uh, the book from by Robert Wright, Why Buddhism is True. I uh, covers a lot of these things in a, in a bit more detail. So that's it, what I had to offer. What do you think? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I suggest that if anybody has a question, you actually approach the computer so uh, Bernd can see you and well as see you, your question. So. The floor is open. Hi, let me start. I'm Derek again. Um, what I want to do is start by um, just offering a couple of uh, applauses. Firstly, I'm delighted to hear um, somebody refer to um, uh, Peter Harvey, who I studied with for a, for a master's. Secondly, I also applaud the uh, the efforts you're making to draw on and conceptualize this kind of issue um, using some of the tools of um, uh, modern science, which, which is also, I think cognitive science, psychology, cognitive psychology, evolutionary psychology, philosophy of mind, neuroscience, anthropology, religious studies, that whole mix is in an extraordinarily fruitful period. So I applaud drawing on that too. Um, not enough Dharma talks kind of tap into that, I think. So I'm glad that you're doing that. Now I want to offer two hmm, short comments and invite you to um, uh, 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 kind of comment on them. Of, in the interest of keeping it simple and short, I'll frame them as challenges. First one is, I think you're being uh, 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 too easy in accepting some of the evolutionary psychology explanations. I don't know if you know uh, the British imperialist writer Kipling. He wrote for children what are called just so stories. How the elephant got a long trunk. It was the ancestors had a big battle with a crocodile or maybe it was an alligator, and stretched its nose. It's a just-so story. It starts with what you've got and makes up an explanation. And the one example I'll pick on is the just-so story the evolutionary psychologists use that, you know, we're stuck with the 
genetic inheritance of 70 or 60 or 80,000 years ago. Well, that's just wrong. There's good evidence to show that um, uh, our genetic inherent, in, inheritance can change in 20 or 30 generations, which is four or maybe 6,000 years. One example, um, uh, the gene that some populations, not all populations, have for um, metabolizing milk. Uh, that's a relatively recent genetic change. What I do like about, and this is my kind of second bit, is the uh, modular theory of the mind, which I think has got strong evidence. And this brings to me my second challenge, which is I think the notion of self, whether it's real or not, is something like a category mistake. It hinges on what you mean, what we mean by illusion and reality. And frequently, I find myself thinking the discussions are just a tad black and white. Mm -hmm. Santa Claus, uh, not sure. I don't have any German at all, so I don't know how well it translates um, uh, into Vienna. But you know that Father Christmas character? Is he real or not? Well, to children, he's very real. It has a social reality even to adults who collude in tricking the kids. So also it's an illusion, but it's an illusion that has a function. And my fi final point on this is, I'm talking to you through a computer. Everybody here, even if this is the first time I've seen it, has some experience of a computer. And probably most of us know about the idea of the the user model of a uh, desktop and uh, 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 a mouse, which we might usefully call a user illusion. Is that real or not? It doesn't actually map into anything that's going on in the electronics, but it's something in my head that is a useful way of planning and navigating the use of the tool. And one way of giving an account of self or what in the cognitive science literature is more commonly called consciousness is it's a coordinator, as you suggest, to control, but also to do forward planning, a coordinator of the, um, uh, uh, of the modules. So this has been a series of statements, but interested in your comments on that. Thank you, Derek. Uh, So I, I, I fully, fully take the criticism of um, the just so story. <laughs> so yes. for, for, for me, uh, when I read about this stuff, because I am not an evolutionary psychologist, um, I'm just a computer scientist. Um, I, I read what I read about these things as just so stories. So, so you are absolutely right there. I, I don't always uh, go in, into depth. So I, I fully accept that. Um, and in terms of um, is, is, it, is it real or is it, is it not real? Um, and it depends on the perspective and role. I, I think you're right there as well. The, the question, however, and, and the reason why I think it makes sense to talk about these things is um, to shatter our firm belief uh, a little bit about how things are. Yes. When, when we look at, at different models, um, of, of how consciousness works, I think all that I'm trying to do, uh, to do is weaken the grip that our normal uh, perception has. And I fully agree with that. It's absolutely necessary um, for us to function in the world that we have those mechanisms in place. So uh, absolutely no doubt about that. Um, but but I, I think um, uh, creating that little bit of space where we can look at things and see if they are helpful in this particular moment as well um, 
that I think is the freedom that we can create with, with our practice and that it is about and 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 breaking up the the rigid kind of perspective or it's gotta be this and this is so true and 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 everything that that lets us not consider anything else and experience anything else for that matter. I think that is what what it's really about. Uh, sorry, I, I have someone at the door. Will you excuse me for ten seconds please? Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? Get them ready. Go on, good. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's very, very Sorry, I'm back. Yes. Yeah, and I entirely accept that and wholeheartedly agree with undermining, so to speak the, if you like, essentialist notion of, of the self or of consciousness. It's, it's like the wind, it keeps changing and dissolving. I say this because I live in Windy Wellington. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Somebody else now. I'm going to uh, bring the, the quality of the debate down quite a lot. Hi, it's Jan again. Um, what, what you just said about freedom I mean, I really appreciate everything that you've said and, and looking at the psychology and behind um, the notions of the self is, in, uh, to me, it's a very fruitful endeavor. But the thing, that it, the thing that the sense of no self gives me is a sense of freedom and experimentation. It's like if I, if I give up some ritual or habit, then I'm free to experiment. And so for me, the no self is it brings with it a sense of potentially not actually because I'm not as good as I my idea but a sense of potentially unbounded freedom to experiment with life with relationships with ways of being with not being tied to in a sense even being tied to my um being tied to the sort of what I've regarded as the limitations of my past whether they're class or gender or education you know it's just like this boundless sense of the opportunity to experiment but thank you very much just interested in your comments i i uh, i'm i do not think at all that this brought anything down in the level of the conversation um i think it's actually very true uh, i think that is really what it is about to to create that freedom um that 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 you talk about and and i um i like another word um that you brought in which which reminds me uh this is all a bit more of a playful thing right so it's not like um we, we, we often approaching this meditation thing, it's super serious and it's all got to go a particular way. It's, it's really like um, trying things out, experimenting a bit, trying new movements, see how they feel, um, but try, try new behavior. So I fully agree with that. Um, it, it, it really opens up to a bit more playfulness um, in, in all of this which I found to be very important in my, my personal practice. So, so one of the things that I also do besides sitting is, is attending Feldenkrais uh, sessions. And, and Feldenkrais is a kind of, um, well, they, well, they call it awareness through movement, which is quite aptly named, I, I think. You, you roll around on the floor basically with little instructions and and try things out, learn movements uh, afresh. Um, and I think meditation practice for me is very much about that. And then also in life. So taking some of the inputs that I get and play a bit with it, uh, rather than rigidly train your mind to do something. So I like that aspect very much, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I just have a short question. To me, in a nutshell, 
what you described. Thanks a lot for it's really sort of giving me a lot of things to think about. But in a nutshell, what I'm what I'm taking in is that it's a matter of having an awareness of things and how we react and our background and you know the psychology and the evolutionary process, so that at the moment we have that awareness, so we can develop that awareness and um, be more fulfilled. Do you think I'm coming from the right direction? Um, yeah, I, I think it is also imp important to not put any particular kind of awareness on a pedestal, if you will. Um, and I think what we are talking about here with this non self thing, this is a quite ordinary experience uh, that you can have in, in quite a, um, a range of, of setting. Uh, of course you can have it in, in meditation, so probably my first non-selfing experience was in my early Zen days when we sat very rigidly for very long periods of time and where you had just to struggle with pain. And, and I think what, what I learned through that, I'm not recommending that at all. So I'm not recommending pain at all, any, any additional. Um, but that's one, one thing that I learned there. Is that uh, at a certain point in time, I was able to kind of go so much into the pain, if you will, um, that the distance to the pain dissolved. Um, or increase it's it's a bit hard, hard to tell but but where there's this moment of where i'm not identifying with pain anymore it's not my pain anymore uh, it's it's not entirely gone i had that too when when it's entirely gone but where there's still that core experience somehow left but i'm not appropriating it and not taking it on as mine and I'm not uh, creating the whole story around it that I usually do. Well, I'm so poor, I gotta sit around all day, it's never gonna end, my knees will really be ruined, whatever I do. So around this sensory core, which is still unpleasant, uh, all the story drops away and with it, a ton of the unpleasantness as well. Um, and, and I think, if if you are into sports or or anything that absorbs you or music, I think there's the same non selfing process going on. If you're really in music, there's the kind of no distinguishing between um, the the sounds that are not any any more out there and and yourself. You are just music, or if you are a runner, you are just running. So, so I think the flow experiences uh, that they describe in psychology are also uh, non-selfing experiences. And I think this is not something very far out or so, so, so kind of enlightenment-like thing somewhere on a pedestal. Uh, it's very accessible. It's not our, under our control. I think we can only set uh, the condition for it to an extent, uh, we cannot create it, as at least I don't think we can, or, or I can't at least, <laughs> I can say that for sure. Uh, but it's not a far out uh, experience, that is for sure, in my opinion. Philip, one thing that comes to my mind is that you don't seem to have acknowledged which I th what I think is very important it's it's the social interactions in all of us which can I think add real um, depth meaning and connection yes. to an individual yes. um, and if you take that away the individual actually sort of can't function and you don't seem to have given much emphasis or relative to that you don't seem to have done that or i might have missed it i'm not sure uh, 
No, I, I, I think you're right. And I did it on purpose in a sense because I had to cut down. I mean, I was talking too long anyway, as I usually do. Um, and, I, and I consciously decided to not talk about the relationship part and more from the internal perspective. So the internal non-selfing, not the external one. So that is a very valid observation. Um, and and you're, you're very right, right in that. Um, I think with Martin Buber, so one of the philosophers, I, I would say uh, we are um, we are our relationships. So I'm 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 not discounting that. I think that is utterly important. It is an, an important conversation uh, uh, observation that you make. It's just down to time, and I, I, I put emphasis today somewhere else. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I think we should say at this point, thank you, Bernd, very much for visiting us here in Wellington. Uh, I'm sure... Well, thanks for listening to me <laughs> patiently. <laughs> <laughs> and we hope one day you might come here for a holiday and then we'll have you here in person. I'm just musing on the fact that um, it's about 15 years I've been... 15 years ago is when I first sat in this particular room in the meditation group and I would never have dreamed at that point that we'd be connecting with anybody in another country, let alone be seeing you as well as hearing you and interacting with you. So this is wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, have, a, have a good day. Good evening. Bye-bye. Good morning.